Alright. Mic check, check, I'm good. So I'm Max Duran, Max, Max Duran, CWB Association Welding Podcast, Pod, Pod, Podcast. Today we have a really cool guest, Welding Podcast. The show is about to begin. Hello and welcome to another edition of the CWB Association Podcast. My name is Max Duran. And this week we are at EdCon in Hamilton, Ontario, here at the beautiful Mohawk Stony Creek campus. We have been having lots of fun interviewing some of the great educators, supporters, and sponsors throughout the week. And today I have Michelle Murray, who is the Director of Operations of ApprenticeSearch.com, who is a sponsor here, but also involved in many of the things we do here at the CWB. We run into each other a lot. We sure do. Yeah, yeah. So how's, how's it going? How's the week so far? The week has been great. Um, It's always exciting. We can get out to different conferences. It's been super busy, but I think that really demonstrates, you know, there's a lot of good things happening to support skilled trades and apprenticeship, and we're happy to be a part of it. So why EdCon, I guess? You know, like, why are you here? What's the connection? Yeah, so Apprenticeurs.com is an online matching service between employers and job seekers in the skilled trades. We have been firm believers for a long time that it's not necessarily um, a lack of interest, for people mm-hmm. going into the skill trades, but more specifically, a lack of conversion. Mm-hmm. So what happens when people are done a youth apprenticeship program, a pre-app program, and that's really where we come in to provide some support. So coming out to EdCon to let folks know from the education perspective that apprenticesearch.com is there for their graduates as a real tangible next step to find that employer sponsor. And this is educators here. So you're here to talk to the instructors to let them know Absolutely. that the students will have these opportunities post graduation of a trades program. Would you feel that your connection is better for the at the college level or or is it even important at the high school level for the awareness to begin? Oh, I think it would even be elementary, to be honest. Like the STEM years, the the five to eight. For sure. And so uh, some of the stuff that we do as an organization is we talk to grade seven students Mm -hmm. about career awareness and workshops and talking about different pathways and really building where you want to go based on your individual value skills and interests. So the work that we do absolutely really covers the senior elementary right through, you know, we've had career changers at 62 years old come to App Search or pursue some of our programs and be like, really want to pursue the trades. I think, you know, average age of an apprentice, 26, 28, there's a lot of years before that. So why aren't they pursuing it earlier on? And how much of what ApprenticeSearch.com is doing now is this type of awareness building, conferences, setting up booths, sponsoring events? You know, is that that kind of a big chunk of the work that you do or is it secondary to the other things that you're doing? Um, It's definitely part and parcel. I think, you know, when we look at our internal team, we have a variety of job coaches, job developers. I mean, we're always looking at the supply and demand. And so part of it is doing this outreach to let, you know, applicants, potential applicants know about ApprenticeSearch.com. Absolutely, the educators to be referring. I mean, people coming through these programs are A candidates for App Search. Mm -hmm. And I think for employers, a lot of them that we work with are small and medium sized shops. They don't have an HR department. They're not going out to conferences. And Mm -hmm. so we can really step in and help them. Bridge that, yeah. Absolutely. And I think the other thing is, is that, you know, if they're graduating and they don't have the support of whatever institution, secondary, post-secondary, and they have questions and they don't know how to find an employer sponsor, we feel like we service a lot of people who lack the networking connections upon graduation to get them to that next step. Now, the work that you do, it's got to be, because you guys are national, right? Yes. So as a national organization, there's got to be some nuances from province to province. You know, so when you're working here in Ontario, which is, I would say, not the strongest province for apprenticeship. It's it's trying to get there very hard right yeah. now. Yeah. But it has fallen quite behind over the last few decades. You know, how much of a, of, of a focus do you have to put into some of these provinces where apprenticeship is not as strong as opposed to, say, an Alberta that has very strong apprenticeship. Yep. You know, do you have to focus more, say, here or Manitoba? You know, we just had a meeting yesterday talking about which provinces, you know, aren't as strong with their apprenticeship growth. Does apprenticeship, does apprentice search look at those provinces and say, okay, we really got to focus there, or is it a blanket kind of across Canada? 
It, it's kind of both, to be honest, Max. Mm -hmm. Like, I think, you know, we've been around since 1999. We are yep. not new. Um, yep. We started as a small regional site when the internet was really just coming up and we had this online database. Mm -hmm. And then we've been provincial in Ontario since. We just launched nationally last September. Yeah. And so... And that was with the new website rebranding and the whole thing, right? Website's the same. Extension okay. of different provinces, territories, okay. and whatnot was the kind of the new side to it. But we've been really fortunate because we've always been out there. We've always been passionate about apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. So we do have connections within different provinces and territories. And a lot of places have been asking for apprentice search for a really long time. Mm -hmm. So going back to your question about the nuances, I think for some provinces, we have those grassroots relationships. So we're able to get in there. We're able to meet with different polytechnics. And they're thrilled that we're expanding. And then yeah. for some other provinces, you know, it's a little bit more about starting at ground zero and building up some relationships. Um, they don't know who we are as much mm. or, you know. Or ha haven't had as much of a need, perhaps. Or not even, it, some provinces are really parsed off too, right? Right, right. And so, you, you know. Look, you what, look at the Yukon where they have so many tradespeople, but they're using the Alberta models. So they're kind of uh, an, on an island, I would say. You know what I mean? For sure. Yeah. And also just what level is based on what criteria, mm, right? Right. In, between provinces and territories, what harmonized. a level one. Absolutely <laughs> not. And sorry, so, sorry, sorry, CCDA and CAF, but it's not harmonized. <laughs> no, and we were just at the Skill Trades Ontario event mm -hmm. and we had a speaker from the Atlantic provinces come out and talk about their harmonization, but also the idea that they were trying to find a level two for one of their um, apprentices and they had to go through five, six, seven different provinces oh, to find... Uh, you know, an equitable level yeah, too. Yeah. So there's lots of work to be done, yeah. but we feel like the niche that we're trying to fill right now is really to be that next step, especially with individuals, again, who lack those networking connections and need some additional supports. There's a ton of interest, but there's also a ton of barriers. Yeah. Now, the niche that you fill, the gap is really between the apprentice who's seeking the mentor. Am I correct in, in that assumption? Or what is it that, that you exactly are trying to connect, like the A to B? Yeah. So at its core, it's an intentional job matching system. It's okay. not keepless. And I think that's the point of difference. Mm -hmm. We're not indeed with a focus on skill trades. We are a technology backed by a ton of people who are really um, connecting with people in real time. So mm -hmm. Every single resume we get from an applicant is reviewed by one of our team members. Um, I mentioned before, working with a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises, our job developers can shortlist and look at the candidates and try to help those smaller shops who lack, you know, a, res a human resource department get the talent that they need. Um, but I think we've really expanded beyond that core element as well to say, what are the supports that people need? Employability skills groups. Um, we do industry networking sessions. If people don't know where to find the employers. Yeah, and you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And the related trades, mm -hmm. the underrepresented trades where there is a demand. That's where we feel we can bring some experts together, bring industry, bring individuals who would likely be really well suited to it, but it may not be their first trade of interest because mm -hmm. they don't know what they don't know. And is there fees to your program or is this funded federally, provincially, private industry? How does it work? Such a good question. So we, <laughs> we've we lived our nine lives at ApprenticeSearch.com. Yeah. There's no question. Um, you know, we have received funding from various levels of government, but we are a not-for-profit social enterprise at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so we do get funding for different projects, which allows us to kind of expand and contract as mm -hmm. needed and really um, hear what the word is on the street. Where is that need? Yeah. And how can we uh, leverage apprentice search? You got to be like Spider-Man. You just swing in it's, when you're needed. We, uh, yeah, <laughs> the, the hair is gray for a reason, but we're thrilled at I national I got way expansion. more gray than you. I don't know. <laughs> it got it. colored recently. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's why we do the work that we do. And it's because we're passionate and we know there's a need. And so we always find a way. But this national expansion as of last September has been a, a long standing dream of ours. And how much work has that been? <laughs> it's been a lot of work. <laughs> it's been a lot of work. I mean, like I run a national program and I know, like, uh, we know we, our heads are spinning some days. We're like, I just, let's just run away and never yeah. come back. <laughs> like, but then you think about what it's like 
on the other end. Yeah, too, they right? need you. They need you, right? And when we see participants come through and do tool pickups and get mm-hmm. emotional and be like, I don't know what I would have done without the support. Mm-hmm. A lot of new Canadians as well who don't really know. I had that on my list to come up here and see like where immigration kind of sits in this too. Yeah. Again, like you're talking about a population who is open to yeah. working in the skilled trades, but for whatever credentialing, um, they need mismatching, some addition- yeah, yeah, mismatching and not knowing what's out there, mm-hmm. not knowing how to tap into different or programs. how our systems even work. You know, the, uh, most countries have some form of an apprenticeship program um, or at least trades development program, yeah, but they're not the same as ours. So you know, they can be a lifelong career something something in country X and get to Canada, and it's not valid. No. So now what do you do, right? And that's exactly it. Yeah. And so, I mean, Max, a couple of years ago, we brought some teachers out to CWB and you did a presentation on all the entry points to get into welding, mm-hmm. union, non-union, mm-hmm. voluntary, compulsory. And like, as somebody who works in the industry, I was like, how would anyone Navigate ever? That. Yeah. yeah. And that's really like, we're that ear and we're that next step to say, we can help you find your next step. Yeah. Now- in terms of let's let's back off of, of apprentice search.com okay. for a second and let's talk about you know Michelle. Okay. So, you know, are you from Ontario? Are you a, a, a local to here? Did you grow up here? Is this your your back your backyard? It is actually. I, I grew up in Ontario. I grew up in Halton. We're in Hamilton right now. Okay, so yeah. this is all very familiar territory. But I really fell into this work. Yeah. And uh the not for profit sphere or this? job specifically both so um i'm one of the rare ones these days who i've actually like i've been with the organization for 20 years wow and that's almost inception it 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 really three or four years old when you came in yeah (laughs) Yeah. well no not me i mean the company because you said it started 99 right well app search did um um, we're part of a larger not-for-profit called Mm -hmm. hayek um but that's been around for 33 years okay but our executive director kelly and myself combined we have 52 years within the organization. So, so did you have an understanding or a passion or, you know, any type of knowledge of the trades prior to getting into this gig? Like, what did you do before? What did you go to university for? Did you go to university? I don't know. Like, yeah. So what's your background? I I have a background in sociology and then I did a post-grad in human services admin with a focus on not-for-profit management. Okay. I ended up meeting Kelly and the way I came in. So you've had a bleeding heart right from the start, right? You know what? I think it's. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful thing. <laughs> well, but I also think the not-for-profit, it drives me nuts when people say, I want to slow it down. Corporate's so busy. I'm going to go work in the not-for-profit where, <laughs> Yeah, well, you, you got to do twice the work at half the freaking it, funding. <laughs> exactly. And so it is a grind. But like I said, the people mm-hmm. that we help, the inspiration that I feel like the organization can provide, um, that's why we do what we do. Isn't that why we... All of us do what we do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You could probably be making more doing welding. The previous podcast we were just talking about. I was like, oh man, maybe I should get back out in the field here. But it's, I really do believe it's a passion project and uh, we're here for it. Yeah. What did you do right before you started working for Apprentice Search? So uh, I was actually, I met Kelly, our executive director, Mm -hmm. as a potential placement. Oh, amazing. So for our college component, we had a practicum Mm -hmm. and she came in and pitched and I had worked in different offices. I'd worked in hospitality, just trying to get through school. And I have parents who are in education and I never really wanted to do that education piece, Yeah, but I like the idea of working with people. And uh, long story short, found Hayek gives us an opportunity to work with students, industry, the broader community. And really the work that we do with Apprentice Search, um, it, it's really just bolstered my love for not-for-profit, but the work in the trades, if I could go back, Max, yeah, oh, I wish I had explored it more earlier. There's so many amazing people and the passion and the pride that people have for their work. Yeah. And we're just super committed. To and you probably it. still would have been in the same chair today, even if you did go into the trades. I hope so. Because it is, a, it, I mean, I'm in the not-for-profit sphere. I worked private. I, I know both sides of it. I've worked union, non-union. I kind of did it all. But uh, being now here in this like fully not-for-profit world where, you know, you're, you're really trying to figure out how to squeeze two bucks out of a buck all the time. Um, <laughs> and, and you find ways. Like you, you find, do. and it's all, it's very much personality based. It's very much authenticity based. You know, something that I would say is different from the corporate world, the private world to the not-for-profit is that in the not-for-profit sphere, 
street cred counts huge. People look for authenticity. People look for, you know, um, passion, you know, yeah. they look for that in, in the, in the people like, you know, when we meet, we go to, we're on these cast things, we're on other programs, we go out there and we, we know who's in it for, who's got skin in the game, right? Yeah. And I think you've hit the nail on the head. For us, it's all about relationships. And so, yeah. you know, your question about going out to different provinces, that was a real passion of ours to make connections across Canada mm -hmm. and understand skilled trades landscape and understand the apprenticeship system. And at the end of the day, like, you can't tell me you do not have a pride and a purpose when you know you have helped somebody. Mm -hmm. And so there's that for sure. But, you know, absolutely. When you see people come in who are not intentional, um, who you can feel it right away. Yeah. And it's true. You see the same faces talking yeah. about the same things at the same time. And that to me kind of demonstrates when people are really in it. Yeah. Now what's the process? Let's say I'm, you know, Billy Joe Murray and I come in <laughs> off the street and I say, you know, I just finished a level one welding program, um, in rural Saskatchewan. I'm really struggling figuring out where to work. There's not a lot of work in my area. You know, what do I do? Yeah. So what would the process, like walk me through that whole thing? So the process would be, we would get them registered. We would be looking at Billy Joe's. And that's uh, to your website, to right? To yeah. com. They're going to get their resume looked at. And then we're going to get them connected to a job coach to kind of understand what are the options. Mm -hmm. Are they looking at relocating? Could we be reaching out to different industries who may be still within the province, but maybe not, like, do they have transportation? Oh, yeah. That is Huge. such a yeah. key question that continues to come up. And then from there, we can talk about different options. And so is that connecting them with employers based on whatever proximity, geography, we can do some outreach in our end. But the big thing too is talking about, are they really ready? Mm -hmm. Or are there some things, additional certifications, tools, opportunities for employer engagement that would be beneficial to make them more successful in their job search. Yeah. And so if that's the case, we can also do that. So it's really a customized experience. There's a lot of wraparound services for in there. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And so that would kind of be, you know, at a very high level, some yeah. of the things that we could be doing for them. And are the companies that you work with only companies that apprentice? Or do you, because like, I mean, that's a barrier because not all shops. No. And some of the biggest shops in Canada don't apprentice, right? Which I'm sure you're like, why don't they all apprentice? <laughs> but, but, you know, really, it's a reality. It's a yep. reality of our Canadian manufacturing sector, especially. Um, do you still have a way to tap into those markets? Or are they kind of just off the books, like a black hole? Well, I think there's other ways that we can work with them. Because if so, our program, Gateway to the Trades, mm -hmm. um, it is a pre-employment with a focus on skill trades awareness, five online modules, but there's a work component at the end. Mm -hmm. And so if they can offer some general labor positions. Some kind of co-op on, on site Exactly. Stuff, yeah. Like the opportunity to explore, get some additional experience, a new network perhaps. And then from there, it's ultimately those employers call, right? Like if someone is going to be wanting to get their ticket and pursue an apprenticeship, it will be with somewhere else. There is a demand. So it will bounce. Yeah. yeah it's going to be ultimately that employer's call on whether or not they want to do you know, the very much original form of mentorship, which mm -hmm. is apprenticeship. Do you feel like your role is also maybe having to cheerlead for apprenticeship, you know, because apprenticeship as a, as a, as a system, they have a governance, they have the Red Seal program, they have their, their umbrella, right? Yeah. But they're not out there pitching apprenticeship at companies to become members, really. It's not really how they do it. Do you feel like maybe that's a little bit on your plate saying, you know, are there companies out there? Why aren't you apprenticing? Why is, you know, especially with some of the, 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 the opportunities we have now for businesses to actually, you know, cash in on apprentices, yeah. you know. For sure. And I think it, that's all part of, I, I want to say sales pitch, but it's so much more meaningful mm -hmm, than mm -hmm. that. I think it's positioning, right? And so my perspective, because we've, we do work with employers in so many different ways through apprenticesearch.com. Yes, ultimately, we want employers to apprentice, and we talk about that. Mm -hmm. But if they are a huge conglomerate with a U.S. parent company where, you know, really the day-to-day -day operations are out of their control, yeah. let's talk about other ways that they can be advocates for experiential learning, 
for other ways to engage young people into skilled trades, but maybe not that apprenticeship component. Yeah. But yes, absolutely. At the end of the day, if we can get in there and pitch app search, pitch the additional supports, pitch skilled trades support from an apprenticeship perspective, then absolutely we're going to do that. Okay. Well, this is a good time to take a commercial break. We're going to take a quick break here and then we're going to come back and I want to start going over some of like the details of things people can do, the bursaries, the funding options, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Because I think there's a whole bunch that people don't know about and we hear about sometimes and have problems sort of diffusing that information out to the public. So <laughs> just stay tuned. We'll be back here just after the commercials from our sponsors and supporters. And I'll be back here with Michelle Murray from ApprenticeSearch.com. The CWB Association is new and improved and focused on you. We offer a free membership with lots of benefits to anyone interested in joining an association that is passionate about welding. We are committed to educating, informing, and connecting our workforce. Gain access to your free digital publication of the Weld Magazine, free online training, conferences, and lots of giveaways. Reach out to your local CWB Association chapter today to connect with other welding professionals and share welding as a trade in your community. Build your career, stay informed, and support the Canadian welding industry. Join today and learn more at cwbassociation.org. And we are back here on the CWB Association podcast. My name is Max Ron. I am here in Mohawk College for the Ed Conference 2023 with Michelle Murray. So right before the break, we were talking about, you know, getting out there and having to do a little bit of cheerleading about everything. Mm -hmm. The industry has uh, got a lot of moving parts, right? And, you know, your company, the company I work with, we're always trying to, like, figure out how are we like the grease? Like I grew up in a very co communist household and my dad always said volunteerism is the grease that keeps the gears turning, you know? And, uh, and so I look at not for profits a lot in that sphere. We're not necessarily always the gear, but sometimes we're the lubricant that helps things move from one end to the other smoothly. Right. Yeah. And when you look at apprentice search, you know, and what you're doing with trying to create a better network of people coming out into the industry having success being an apprentice and then moving into their red seal and success for their life. You know, what are some of the pinch points there? What are some of the obstacles that you have seen now in 20 years or whatever that come up repeatedly in this journey? Well, I, I think, you know, as a skill trades community, we could probably all denote the similar drop-off points for apprenticeship, right? Mm -hmm. So in Ontario, a number of years back, they did this massive chart called the journey chart with all the different points of drop-off and why people aren't completing their apprenticeship. And there are some really obvious ones, right? Like the idea of um, specific supports for women in the trades, for mm -hmm. example, right. you know, whether that's shift work, daycare, sick leave, uh, clothing that is safe and appropriate for yeah. females versus their male counterparts. There has been some harassment Absolutely. and, you know, some workplaces that are not doing the right thing around mentoring and yeah. making sure it's an inclusive place. There's also things like the lack of networking connections, the inability to procure tools, um, some of those wraparound supports, which seem really straightforward, mm. but a lot of them aren't out there. And so yeah. getting people into program they can flourish when the right supports are in place. Yeah. And for us, I think, again, that's kind of where we're coming at it from because we, if we can provide you with a tool set oh. or a working at heights training that will make you actually eligible to go and interview with a union, yeah, those are things that we can do. And we had um, a participant in one of our programs a couple of years ago who had come from another country. He had a job offer with the TTC, but they needed to get his transcripts right. and they were $600 from his home country. Holy. And so the TTC would not cover it. Mm -hmm. And that was something that we could do. Like yeah. that $600 to get his transcripts allowed him to get a job. And he's going to pay taxes and make money for everybody. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, it's things like that. So sometimes it's really obvious drop off points. They don't have an employer. If block release and they haven't done the right kind of financial planning right. to make sure that, you know, money is great when they're working, but what about when they're doing their school portion? Mm -hmm. Block release, have they factored going on to EI? So things like that. Some are more uh, obvious, some are more individual based on their own circumstances. But I feel like collectively we have this toolkit of supports to help nudge people along. Yeah. So you're really trying to, or have looked at what those points are and trying to be there for basically all of them. How can you help at any of these steps? 
we're trying, right? Like if we're able yeah. to procure funding and dollars from different levels of government, foundations, whatnot, to support these initiatives, it's not our money. Yeah. We want it to be successful. We want to get more people into skill trades and apprenticeship. So I like, we are of the mindset that if there's a way that we can support you, because who would think transcripts from a home country mm -hmm. would be a game changer to get an apprenticeship? Yeah. So like, it, we really just want to be there for, and if it's within our ability to really customize and curate those supports, that's what we're here for. Is there any reach outside of Canada for your group? Is there <laughs> any external reach? That That's our next quest for role domination, oh, Max. Oh, oh. No, um, I mean, we've had <laughs> conversations for sure. Uh, we've done some work with the National Association of Workforce Sports mm -hmm. out in the States. Um, we've gone to states like California to talk about what we're doing. But it's I mean, it's tough in places that don't have apprenticeship. Well, it's, I mean, you're talking <laughs> about the inconsistencies across Canada. Yeah, no, the US is a whole other beast. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, not now, but never say never. I mean, trade unions are obviously a, a door opener. Because the trade unions we have here in Canada, most of them are replicated in the U.S. Yeah. Not all, but most. Um, and they all have an apprenticeship portion, right? Yeah. So that would be, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just brainstorming for yeah. you. Yeah, no, I, I love it. <laughs> but you know what, though? Being from Canada, from Ontario, doing this national expansion, mm -hmm. like there is something about doing it in your own backyard mm -hmm. and in your home country. And I don't know, a lot of the faces and the people and the players, so to speak, who have really been the pioneers for skill trades and apprenticeship, it feels really good to be able to support those individuals too. Do you, does your group have boots on the ground in every province or, or like, is everything kind of based out of one central location? Uh, a little bit of both, depending on the province. We do work with um, different organizations that we work with mm -hmm. that can do some outreach in their own community. The reality is, is that our philosophy is it takes a village. Yeah. It's not going to be one institution one employer, one way of doing things. And so we know um, through our work as a not-for-profit social enterprise, we have some sister organizations across the country who have amazing relationships mm -hmm. in their communities. So if we can leverage those and support that organization, that makes more sense. There's yeah. nothing worse than having somebody come into your community and tell you from a totally different perspective but, how things are going to yeah, roll. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think if we can build capacity through other organizations, and our friends and partners across the country. That said, you know, our team has been out a lot. Yeah. A lot I've, of provinces. I've <laughs> seen you guys everywhere for the last month now. Yeah. And I think over three different provinces. Yeah. And that's <laughs> just, I think for the most part, we have been out to most, if not all provinces. And yeah. so, you know, it's, it's busy, but it's exciting. But we're really trying to have a presence at as many places as we can as we continue you know, to build that national awareness. Well, and you know, you brought up an, an important point about the backyards, you know, that's something that we had to change in our strategic plan at the, uh, at the association is that we were very much a top down kind of approach sort of company or our layout. And we have 17 chapters across Canada that we kind of were feeding information, feeding, you know, do this, do that. And, you know, when I got hired, I was like, that feels backwards. Because exactly to your point, why would I go to Calgary and tell them how they should do an event in Calgary? I'm from Regina, Saskatchewan. And trust me, if you want me to throw an event in Regina, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I got gotcha you because I got the contacts. I know the people. I know the industry. So why would we not just give the people in Calgary the freedom? And we just support. We just support their initiatives to do it because they're going to do it better. Yeah. They're just going to do better. And it's actually cheaper, right? It's actually cheaper to not have that, that amount of movement and just let the locals do what they do best and support them, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, not to belabor the whole pandemic point, but I think it's forced us mm -hmm. to look at doing national, international work differently, right? Yeah. And so, you know, absolutely. I think that if somebody is doing some really great stuff in their community, again, coming from a not-for-profit perspective, we quite often get told about well, so-and-so is doing this and so-and-so, the government is going to be <laughs> yeah. rolling out this initiative. We've got this. Yeah, yeah. We have been on the front lines mm -hmm. for 20 plus years with ApprenticeSearch.com and we know what it feels like when other people come in with their very limited experience and scope. Mm -hmm. 
and tell us how we're going to do things. So yeah. why would we do that to other communities? Yeah, everyone is bringing their own strengths to when the table. When something comes in and everyone <laughs> in the office shakes their head, everyone's like. <laughs> or when you go and have a meeting, I mean, government has been great. And this mm -hmm. government, uh, provincially and federally, have That's been very supportive very generous, yeah. of our initiatives, yeah. of skill trades and apprenticeship overall. Mm. But, you know, there's a lot of transition in government. And it's mm -hmm. not always that everyone in that portfolio has the expertise. And you never know who's coming. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a constant game of um, relationship management, <laughs> yeah. onboarding new individuals. And so mm -hmm. I, I just think there are some amazing people across our country who have been doing great work for a long time. So let's mm -hmm. empower them to continue that work. And if we can tag apprenticesearch.com onto that or the work that we do with the Canadian Apprenticeship Service grant, let's do it that way instead. That's what my next question was going to be about. Is it, We talked about pinch points with people. But what yep. about pinch points with business? You know, they have obviously some either reservations about taking on apprentices, perceived loss of, of, of productivity from taking on young people and as opposed to someone with more experience. So, you know, when we, we look at the Canadian Apprenticeship Service and, and the work that's happening there, you know, that's something that I feel got created to try to, try to work with those pinch points. You know, what do you think about these programs? What are these programs? Is there other ones like it? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's part of, let me, okay, let me back yeah, up and I'll yeah. answer All the right. first thing first. Yeah. So CAS is the Canadian Apprenticeship Service Grant. It's a federal initiative um, to support level one apprentices. And so basically if an employer is going to sign a level one apprentice in 39 Red Seal trades with a focus on manufacturing and construction, mm -hmm. we can give that employer anywhere from five to $10,000 and they can benefit from up to four apprentices. I wish I had a little ching button here. Ching. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, yes, we need more level ones. And you're mm -hmm. talking about the pinch points. That first sign, that opportunity mm -hmm. to pursue your level one, that is obviously where we're trying to overcome here. But that being said, like CAS is an amazing opportunity, but there's lots of provincial yeah, and smaller grants and... You know, and I think that's Retention where a lot of... Retention money from the colleges, from the education systems. Yeah. yeah. And I think the nice thing about CAS is that it's very straightforward. Yeah. You're going to go through a very straightforward process. You're going to register on apprenticesearch.com. We're going to support with um, either an apprentice or letting, uh, let's say, polytechnics in your area know that you're looking. Like we can make those um, connections, have mm -hmm. those conversations on your behalf, and then you're going to get your money. That's very different than, you know, some wage subsidies where it's a percentage of payroll to a max of, yeah. and what that And you have to submit weekly and all yeah. these things. And yeah. truthfully, like yeah. some of the uh, financial incentives that we provide, and there's been various ones over the years, people say it's not worth it. Like the it's administrative. Yeah. So coming back to CAS, I think it's trying to be as intentional, straightforward as possible. So more level one apprentices get signed. Like, this is something I've been asked. But I'll ask you, is there a cap? Say I'm a company that wants to take on 40 apprentice level ones. And, you know, can I get, and let's say they're all indigenous women, yep. you know, so you're going to get your 10K yep. for, for each. Am I going to get a, you know, a $400,000 check from the government for this? Or no, what's 40 so, times 10,000? Is that right? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a welder but, here. I'm, hey, <laughs> good news. It's, yeah. So it is a cap of four. So okay. we don't need to do the math for 400. Yeah. <laughs> but um, there, the, but four, like for most companies, and you also have to remember, and the, the big thing to note too, is that we're looking at focusing on some of those SM, small, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So we're looking at companies with 499 employees or less um, because they are harder to break mm -hmm. into. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we want to provide those additional supports. That being said, as a <laughs> cheerleader for apprenticeship, I wish more large companies would be taking on 400 apprentices. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I mean, I know companies right now that want to hire 400 welders, but they don't want to apprentice them. And it's like, ah, come on. Yeah. You know, I, there's, there's a gap there. Let's ask that. Why is there that gap? Why are companies apprehensive <clears throat> to apprentice? I, I mean, I think we would Is there probably, a cost that they think is there? I think there's a cost. There's an investment. There's a fear potentially of poaching when a larger yeah. company comes along after the financial investment for a level one to be poached by a bigger company. Um, you know, personal perspective is something like a shared apprenticeship model. And I know that comes with a lot of contention. <laughs> and I know. 
But doesn't it make the industry stronger overall? And I get that the smaller shops competing with larger companies. Yeah. I understand that. But ultimately, the demand is not going to be met unless we're cranking out apprentices. Yeah. And everybody has a role to play within that. Um, ultimately, should have a role to play with. Should have yeah. a role to play. But I think for a lot of individuals, like they are just that, they're individuals. And what they want, do they want to work in a big company? Do they want to work in a small company? Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people that we work with love the vibe of working in a small family-focused shop where, you know, you're actually building relationships. Yeah, you have, you have more input. You have more say with what's getting done. And, yeah. and you learn a lot more equipment because it's not so parsed out, right? Yeah. I just don't think we can go based on the assumption that people shouldn't an apprentice because they're going to get poached at the end of the day. Yeah. Poaching happens for other reasons. I'll, you know, as I, someone who's been in the industry a long time, getting that red seal doesn't mean that you're going to leave the company. Um, if you're leaving the company, it was going to happen red seal or not. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's a culture. The company keeps you. It's yep. not even really the wages at the end of the day. I mean, I'm not going to play that card all the way. Wages do matter. Sure. Sure. But culture matters a lot too. Right. And I think, generations that are coming up we know mm -hmm. we um career development we're a big career development focused organization it is about relationships it's mm -hmm. about feeling like you're part of something with a purpose and for a lot of the apprentices that i've worked with that i've spoken to the fact that they're so passionate about their work i think they also want their employer to demonstrate the passion for what they're doing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now if we back up and we look at apprenticeship or apprenticesearch.com, yeah. you know, what's the next level? What's the bigger challenge? What could we do, you know, when you think of dream state of, of what you could offer and how it can be offered, what do you see? Well, uh, I'll be super candid, like consistent funding to run yeah. something like apprenticesearch.com. I mean, we are not chasing that down every year. Every yeah. year. And yeah. so, you know, we know it works. We know the supports are making a difference. Mm -hmm. The numbers that we are seeing are huge. They are. And I guess as somebody who has been there since almost the beginning, mm -hmm. the amount of personal investment that has come with that to make sure that it can continue to run. I think that we need, you know, ongoing provincial and federal funding to make sure that these services and supports are in place. Um, we've always been niche. And I think that's a blessing and a curse a little bit mm -hmm. because we are focused on a particular population, a particular scope of work but we're doing a really good job. Yeah. And so, you know, and that's, like, that's kind of how it needs to be because yeah. you get too broad and you lose focus. I think so. And the other thing is, well, why do you need the people there? Like yeah. it's a technology, let the technology, let AI do it. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, people are over <laughs> AI. People who want to ask questions, mm -hmm. like how many times do you call a bank? Yeah. Or Me, what never. have you. I hate it. <laughs> but you know, you <laughs> yeah. just speak to auto attendants the whole yeah, time. And then yeah. it's just like this cycle of going back to the same auto attendant. Mm -hmm. At App Search, we are really intentional about having people. And it's our people that make the difference. It's people mm -hmm. who care about helping people and taking them to the next step. And we can't do it without that. But that type of compliment requires resources and funding. So why doesn't that exist? This is a broad question. Like why doesn't that happen? Like, you know, for a not-for-profit that has the proof in the pudding, obviously yeah. a need. Governments have identified this for decades now of yeah. what we need, what needs to happen. And there's agencies that are doing it, right? Yeah. Um, why do you have to chase that dollar every year? Like, why is it not, is, is it a focus that happens or is it just the way it is? You know, because I don't, I don't know that side of it, right? Yeah. Like, it, it's a bit of a complex question. I think, you mm -hmm. know, because we are a not-for-profit social enterprise with no overarching infrastructure funding, we don't fit like an employment services model, although we offer employment services, mm -hmm. but we don't get funded the same way. Right. Um, the other thing is that I think one of the questions we get is just get the employers to pay, just get the employers to pay. Yeah, well, if always, they would have done that, we wouldn't need this. <laughs> like, it, it, it's part and parcel. And I kind of have two answers there. Like, number one, it will always be free for apprentices. Yeah. Getting industry contribution post pandemic while scaling up a national service, <laughs> it's, it's not for the faint of heart, right? Yeah, so, yeah. like, it, it always makes me laugh. We're like, just go out and sell a membership model. Right. Yes. Yeah. But that's a whole wing 
of yeah, work, right? That's and right. so we got rid of our paid membership model. We went the other way. We're like, let's make everything free. Yeah. Because then it opens up internally resources. Yeah. Like, sure, you're not bringing in that money, but think about if you didn't have to chase money with that staff that has to. It's. It would open up so much more time it, internally. Absolutely. Yeah. It's really resource intensive, right? Yeah. And so. Long story short, I mean, we have had some great support, both provincially and federally, mm -hmm. but long term, it's always going to be right at the top of our focus because we're only as good. Mm -hmm. But I do think the stride that we've hit with App Search is like a whole new chapter. And I'm confident that with the success that we're seeing and experiencing, like we'll continue. But the reality is it takes one change of government to kind of start that process over again, right? Is there a fear that it could end? Is that... Like, I mean, there's always like, <laughs> well, yeah, to be no, honest, you know, I, like, could, could the wheels fall off? Like government comes in and says, you know what? There's no funding for trades in, in, if, at all, which I don't think that's likely, but. Yeah. So in 20 years, we have been as big as 35 people. We have been as small as four people. Oh, we wow. are, and I say this with all the love and respect in the world, we're cockroaches. Yeah. Like we yeah. do not die easily because we are passionate about what we're doing. Yeah. And we have been able to sustain. We have done it through social enterprise. We have done it through program funding. Now, it's not maybe always the same offering, the same size and scope, mm -hmm. but we're committed to this and we will find a way. Yeah. And um, we don't go away easily. And I think, again, just the um, awareness, the fact that we are getting recognized the the national piece has just been huge. So yeah. I'm not worried by any means, but I mean, it's always going to be a Are you guys in stride right now? Is this, Absolutely. A, is this like a growth time, a boom time for you? It's a growth time and a boom time because with the proper resourcing, we can do so many other things, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not just we need applicants, we need employers. It's all those additional supports that we can build out. And I do believe that that's the game-changing component Yeah, because people can have an interest but if they're not quite there yet, chances are they're not going to get there on their own. Without, They'll float off. You know? Exactly. They'll find something else. Like, I mean, one of the biggest issues that we find in our industry in the welding is the attrition from first year to Red Seal. You know, do you feel like programs like yours will help with that gap, you know, where that drop off where it's been? Like, I, I think it was four out of 12 welders make it to yeah. Red Seal. And it's even less for women. One in 20 make it to red seal in in the welding trades and like i mean that's sad because i'll have a when i was an instructor i'd have 12 students yeah some were stronger than others and some were weaker than others but i totally saw a place for all of them in industry 100 percent. yeah industry needs them all doesn't matter yeah you're the best 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 welder yeah sure we'll work at nasa cool but the worst 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 welder there's still a job for you and a great career and everything you want but then you find out these statistics that only four of them are even around at all and yeah. it's like, ah, oh, what do we do? I, I, I think it takes a community and mm -hmm. I'm not trying to sound Pollyanna about yeah, it and super yeah. naive, but you know, I guess my question would also be, have you ever asked why? Yeah. And that's a big thing. We constantly at our company are trying to figure out how do we track this? Cause people just fall off the grid after college yeah. and it's kind of impossible to track them, yeah. you know? So like, could those, whether it's additional certifications, additional tools, um, opportunity to connect with more employers. Like we do something in our program gateway to the trades called math therapy. Okay. Can we have a minute for math therapy? Because it mm -hmm. has been a game changer. Yeah, for sure. It just for people who are so scared about math, who have never learned it properly, who didn't gravitate towards it to actually break it down and overcome that barrier. We've had people in tears mm -hmm. thanking um, the gentleman who was doing the math therapy because he looks at it very much as that, as a therapy, as a wellness mm -hmm. piece. That's something so little. Like if we could do more math therapy to get more people more confident yeah. to do an aptitude test, like I... It, to really, you know, determine the weaknesses and the strengths and work with them. Yeah. And yeah. I feel like that's why we've been so successful recently. I mean, we've always done it, but with the additional funding and the opportunity... Math therapy. I know. You know, it was interesting. I did an interview uh, probably about a year ago now, and I was talking about how important math is in the trades. I, and I, I guess I was lucky that I like math. I've always yeah. liked math. I couldn't, I failed English twice, but I was always pretty good at math. And that has served me well. My sister is, uh, she's scared of numbers. Like it was, a, like, like you said, like she needed like a therapy. She was like afraid of math. And then eventually when she got over that hurdle, she's very good at it. Yeah. It was just a matter of getting over this perceived notion that it was so 
stressful, you know? Yeah. And, and in this interview about a year ago, I said, you know, welding is a very important to have math. And the person I was interviewing was like, never say that because that's how you get rid of anybody yeah. that wants to sign up. As soon as you say you got to be good at math, the sign up numbers drop to zero because it's like scares people. And I was like, really, it's that strong of an effect, you know, like it really, like, it's almost like you got to hide. It's like sneak the math in, right? Yeah. Like, but imagine if you said, hey, math's really important, but here are the things that we'll we get can you there. do to make sure you get there. Yeah. Like when you talk about math, I deal with a lot of budgets within our organization. Mm -hmm. But I can remember the grade five Michelle being told to stand in front of the whiteboard and work on a math problem. <laughs> and you're going to stay there until you get it in front of the entire class. Yeah. And I was petrified. Yeah. But Aww. it's fine. No, but it's finding the right way. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, and so now I work with numbers all the time and yeah. I enjoy it. Thank, thank you, Excel, for doing all the hard math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Excel for yeah. sure. But at the end of the day, like, I know what that feels like. I can mm -hmm. write papers and I can speak to people all day long. But I think if someone had just said, you know what? Yeah, math is a big component, but it's not what you think it is. It's not as scary. And here's the supports that we can. Well, and in reality, most people are doing the math every day already. They just don't know they're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And so I think just more individualized supports, which are not, you know, it's not rocket science. It's just putting in place mm -hmm. where those drop-off points are and trying to get to them before that happen. What other kind of cool stuff do you have? Like, I didn't know about math therapy. No. Yeah. I, I, I want to take it now just to I, know what it is. <laughs> I, want, I sign up. So um, some of the supports, like we partnered with Ryobi Tools. Uh, we did a research project oh, a few years. Oh, Ryobi. Her dad yeah. loves Ryobi. Oh, we'll chat after. <laughs> Honestly, it looks like we have a Ryobi showroom. So shout out to Ryobi. <laughs> Ryobi and Home Depot have been incredibly supportive. They believe in what we're doing. And so, you know, not only do they come out and do tool demos with some of our program participants, but they've also donated a ton of stuff. And so, um, you know, things like the tools. Mm-hmm. People can't afford tools. And they're very expensive. And so. And they know, don't last forever. No. <laughs> yeah. PPE. Yeah. Mr. Safety Shoes. Big shout out to you because mm -hmm. they have supported us tremendously as well. But like people have come back and be like, I had to work outside and I didn't have a jacket. Oh, man. Like yeah. when it's that baseline support mm -hmm. and now you have a warm Hope to do outdoor work. Yeah. Like, and without it, this job is now not fun and it's exactly. very discouraging. Yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, the math therapy we talked about, mental health supports. We're working with. That's something that we've gone into a lot, offering free mental health classes yeah. almost every month. Yep. Yeah. So we have a standing, you know, we have a block of appointments every week that are dedicated to some of our program participants. And so it's totally anonymous. You just need to fill out, you know, an overarching form through them. Mm -hmm. And you can go and get your free um Shout out to supports. mental health programs. My yeah. mom's a social worker. I grew up in a very cognizant house of mental health. Yeah. So I uh, I feel like everyone should take therapy. I say this to Danielle. I feel like it should just be standard. Like 14 years old, you go to therapy. Like every yeah. human being, like you need it. <laughs> but life is not easy, right? No, the last not. few it's... years have not been easy. Yeah. We were talking about the cost of living earlier. Yeah. That is not easy. I had a program participant come through and say, yeah, I really want to go into electrical. I'm so excited. I'm dedicated. And I said, oh, hey, I know this one institution, this instructor there. I know they would talk to you. And he looked at me. He's like, well, I can't do it now because I have to put food on the table for my family. But one day I'm going to do it. So I'm looking for something part time and we can work with them. But like when you're trying to put food on the table, it, you're you're talking about short succession of your yeah. next thought or your yeah. next plan of action. Right. Yeah. So I I interviewed a lady named Ray Ripple once, and she said to me, when you're poor, you don't plan, right? And I always think about that. It's like, so true. it's so true. Like you're in survival mode when you are, when you're on the low end of the financial scale and yeah. you're not dreaming about futures. You're not dreaming about goals. You're thinking about tomorrow, yep. tonight. That's it. That's as far as it goes, yep. right? Which is why like, it's not our money. Yeah. We want to support people. And so if that means, you know, uh, whatever, a particular course that maybe is outside of scope for what we traditionally offer, but it's still in line with the project deliverables, why can't we offer that course? Yeah. So, you know, at the end of the day, like, I think, again, that's that mindset. 
And that ability to really customize and curate supports is why I think we are having the success we are. And we're here to help. All right. Well, we're getting close to the interview end here, but I want to ask you a question about us. What kind of synergies could you see between what we do here at the association and apprentice search? You know, like what can we do to support each other, help each other, what you yeah. know, stuff like that? Well, I, I think it's a great question. I think we also have some real tangible examples of how we have partnered mm -hmm. before, right? So I mean, everything from having a presence at some of our events, talking about careers in welding, talking about entry points, um, advocating to your membership that we have programs, whether it's apprenticesearch.com getting more of your employers to register on there. Mm -hmm. Math, are, therapy. math therapy. Math <laughs> therapy. Um, getting more um, opportunities for educators. Mm -hmm. Secondary school guidance, for example. Like, they have a lot on their plates, but mm -hmm. they are ultimately kind of the voice that's talking to young people about next steps beyond graduation, even within the trades. And mm -hmm. so um, I think we have we have some work to do there. Yeah. Um, I also think just endorsing the Canadian Apprenticeship Service, you're on our national advisory, mm -hmm. but getting the word out there, because as much as we feel like we're pounding the pavement and we are trying to get out to as many provinces and territories as we can, we're a group. You have yeah. all these members. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I know that you're already doing a lot of this, but I think more of that. Yeah. And finding better ways to do it. Cause like we like getting more creative and how to do it, how to yeah. get the message to stick you know, I saw those numbers from year one to year two. Great, but we could do better. We can do better. We can do better. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, we doing national expansion from a site perspective, from a visibility perspective, it, it was a lot. And now we've really hit our stride. So let's, I know we can knock our targets out of the park. Yeah. We already are. Yeah. And so um, I think with the support of more associations and more groups like CWB, we can absolutely do it. I was it. just thinking about the meeting yesterday. It's like, oh, I wish we had a contact in this city. I do. You know, like we're it's, national. We have so many members. I got a bazillion, bazillion yeah. contacts and it's like, okay. But then I get kind of sad because I'm like, that's just welding. You know, is there groups like the CWI? And I know we're very privileged because we're a non-union trade association, which yeah. is very rare, rare, very rare. And I, I'm, I'm hard pressed to find three or four other examples globally in the trades. The lawyers have them, the doctors have them, the chiropractors have them. All these other yeah. jobs have them, but in the trades, it seems to kind of have been left out. Is there other groups like the CWB representing other trades with like the breadth of, of, of memberships or reach? I mean, I'm sure that there are similar. We work with a lot of associations. Mm -hmm. I think the point of difference, like you said, is that the non-union piece. But we also work with a ton of really great union partners. Yeah, yeah. So I think for us, it's a little bit of everything. And it can't just be one type of partner. Yeah. Um, but I think you're speaking to relationships too, Max, like the idea that you have a contact there, the work that we do is so based in relationships. And so we also don't think we can do it all on our own. We absolutely need the relationships that we've built yeah. to help us promote app search. Not for profits, it's collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Yeah. And that's why we continue yeah, to see yeah. each other at all these yeah. things. But I think CWB has been an amazing example of what it means to be a supporter. I'm not just saying that because I'm on your podcast. Like it is. <laughs> But She's not need, getting paid no, for this. No. <laughs> we need more CWBs to be like, hey, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna represent across the country on behalf of App Search and mm -hmm. CAS and get more people into skill trades. Awesome. All right, a couple questions just to wrap it up. Number one, you know, coming from a non-industry world and then kind of becoming such a proponent of it now, you know, what are some of the skills in your personal life that you felt translated well to your success in this journey? That's a really great question. I think communication, right? Like the ability to be able to go out and talk to people um, over the last few years, I think it's become even more of a lost art. I think, mm -hmm. you know, being <laughs> inside your home for a long mm -hmm. time doesn't do great things Talking for your ability. Talking to the plants is different. <laughs> exactly. Um, I think the other thing too is just like a willingness to learn, right? Like I yeah. know it sounds cliche, but the truth is like I didn't, grow up knowing everything about skill trades and apprenticeship. My brother's a stonemason. I've always been in awe of how he could just rip a package apart and put and something together. Created. And I'm the one who's standing in front of the whiteboard who can't figure out the math problem. <laughs> but I think a willingness to learn. And I think, you know, paying attention and listening and not always feeling like you have to have the floor. Um, it's really important to listen to those around you. And I think that those skills have really brought me here. Um, and it's not always easy. Like I, 
I do want to say I am so proud of our team to be a female-led team mm -hmm. working in skill trades and apprenticeship. And, you know, the fact and very that, successful. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, I mean, it's changing for sure, but there are lots of places that we show up and we are not the majority. Mm. So, you True. know, the fact that we're able to do that um, and continue to be successful in it is a huge shout out to our executive director, Kelly Hoey as well, because I mean, she knows this inside and out and she, mm -hmm. she is. Well, a, Kelly was supposed to be here. She got off the hook here. Kelly did. <laughs> I'm, I'm Kelly Jr. And I'll get her. I'm going to get her on the show. She's not going to oh, escape for that long. Yeah, No, yeah. she's, um, she's a force. <laughs> yeah, she is. She's wonderful. So, yeah. And she's always got like ideas. Like ideas just fall out of her head. She is like, <laughs> one of the most creative people I yeah. know. And it's her tenacity mm -hmm. and her creativity um, in getting out there and continuing to build app search what it is and. It's been an amazing ride. Yeah. And for the last question, what advice would you give um, a young, I should not, I should say that's, that's improper, a new to the trades person, whether they're young or old, but they want to get into this trades world from whatever industry they came from or whatever job or background they have. What advice would you give someone that's looking to get into the trades in terms of first steps? You know, including apprentice search, yeah. but, what, but so, other stuff too. So yeah. obviously, you know, reach out to apprenticesearch.com. Yeah. But I think beyond that, do some research. Yeah. So there is an about trade section on app search where you can look at different trades, but within those trades, they're going to give you related trades as well. Mm. Because I think everyone wants to be the ones that they recognize. I want to be an electrician. I want to be a plumber. But do you know, a sprinkler fitter is actually really in demand right now. Yeah. I mean, boilermakers. We mm -hmm. do a lot of work, but boilermakers... I don't think a lot of people are even going to know what a Boilermaker does, yeah. yet it's one of the most in-demand trades in the country. Yeah. And so doing some research, not just holistically, but within your area. Yeah, dig in, dig in. Yeah. Because like an informed decision is the best decision, right? Yeah. So there are networks and supports out there. Um, and again, I'm not just trying to tote app search, but this is at the end of the day what we do. Mm -hmm. And we want to give people hope. There is a way and there are people out there who can support you. Um, yeah. But yeah, definitely become informed, be aware, and tap into resources. There are a lot of programs out there trying to arm um, young men, women, however you identify to get into the trades. And that even that can be daunting, but there are lots of yeah. programs. Pick one you, and go. Yeah. 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 As a step, right? Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much uh, for being on the show. You, it's been a wonderful conversation. And I think our listeners are going to learn a lot. Awesome. Thanks for, so much for this opportunity. It's always a pleasure. You bet. And thank you for everyone that's been following along here at EdCon. If you have never been to an educators conference in Canada, make sure you check them out. If you're an educator of any kind, and I'm not even going to say welding. I'm, if you're a, you know, IA or industrial arts or any type of construction or any type like of, of educator at the secondary or post-secondary, this is a great networking event just to see what's going on in the trades world in the education spheres and it's been running 11 years we're going to keep going strong and make sure you get to an edcon aside from that we'll see you in canweld in october in new brunswick um hopefully you guys are out there with us we haven't talked about that yet but it's gonna happen we'll be there we'll yeah and uh and keep downloading and sharing the podcast our successes from you guys thank you very much and stay tuned for the next one we hope you enjoy the show